Acts chapter 1, Sunday night through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. And we'll pick things up in just overlapping a single verse for what we looked at last time. Jesus' promise to the disciples related to the baptism with the Holy Spirit in verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, when Jesus had spoken these things to the disciples, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud and received, uh, and uh, taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And so uh, Jesus has promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, to the church. And then now tonight we will see uh, that uh, what he always does, we sang about it a couple times tonight, that uh, he is absolutely faithful to keep his promises. And, and uh, so he, he uh, provides that baptism with the Spirit. We're told here in uh, verses uh, 9, really through 11, and let's continue in verse 10. And while the disciples looked up steadily as Jesus is ascending into heaven, uh, steadily looked steadfast uh, toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, obviously angels, and they said, also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so uh, we know uh, a little bit later here in a single verse, verse 12, that this ascension of Jesus back into the glory of heaven, it occurs on the Mount of Olives and uh, there on the east side of, uh, of Jerusalem. We're told in Matthew's gospel that uh, that Jesus led the disciples. He spoke to them about the baptism with the Holy Spirit in the city of Jerusalem proper. He then leads them out to the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley, and uh, there uh, he lifted up his hands, he blessed them, and he ascended uh, into uh, heaven. And so his ascension, we're told that he was taken up. Uh, he had uh, was uh, taken up into heaven in this ascension because he had now uh, formally finished everything that he was intended to do bodily in his incarnation and uh, in his life and his ministry. All of that was complete on the earth. And so he left the heavenly scene and he re-entered re into that heavenly glory. It tells us that a, a cloud received uh, him out of their sight. And you notice those two phrases in verse uh, nine, he was taken up and then also that he was uh, received. It speaks to the fact that heaven was eager to have him back. Uh, in, in the midst of that, that glory and, uh, and that scene. I've never, you never really stop and think about it, but uh, we are so thankful for his 33 uh, and a half years of his life and his public ministry uh, upon the earth. And so we are unspeakably thankful for that. Um, but imagine the dynamic, the sense of sacrifice that was involved in heaven for uh, his presence in this way, being absent from that environment in order that we might be saved. They were happy to have him uh, back home. When it talks about that cloud there, the cloud isn't that Jesus ascended up into heaven and then some kind of a cumulus cloud came across and they lost sight of him in there. It almost certainly speaks of the fact that this was the, uh, the cloud that is uh, known as the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament, uh, the glory of, uh, of God that represents the presence of God and, uh, and engulfing him in that glory and delivering him then into heaven. So he ascends, he's immediately enveloped by uh, the Shekinah cloud and uh, this manifestation of God's glory and, and God's uh, presence and his approval. And I, I like this scene because uh, it, it communicates to us in his ascension, it communicates to us that whatever man thinks of Jesus, however the world esteems Jesus, he always has been, always is, and always will be uh, highly, unspeakably, highly esteemed 
uh, in heaven itself, and heaven understands uh, the treasure that he, uh, that he is, and this separation between the attitude of heaven toward Jesus and the attitude of the world so often to Jesus speaks of uh, the great gulf, the great distance that exists between uh, these two places, and uh, it'll be wonderful to be fully immersed one day as Christians in that, uh, that different place. The ascension of Jesus is uh, so important that it is mentioned in the book of Acts and it's mentioned in the Gospels no less than 20 times. And so why is it important? What's its significance? Well, uh, the ascension at the very least, Jesus' ascension into heaven was God's, uh, God the Father's stamp of approval upon uh, the entirety of Jesus' life uh, his ministry, his teaching, uh, upon what Jesus claimed his death, burial, and resurrection meant for mankind, and, uh, and this ascension into heaven uh, accomplished that. Jesus' resurrection from the dead was, uh, was uh, God the Father's stamp of approval upon his, his life and his teaching, and his provision of salvation to mankind. And this is kind of the double seal of a good housekeeping seal that's put on him in terms of heaven. I don't know if it's because in the Old Testament every fact was confirmed by two witnesses, but uh, both the witness of the resurrection and Jesus' ascension is, is to uh, we stand behind everything that he was, everything that he said, and everything that he uh, did. Now there in verse 10, when they are steadfastly uh, looking up uh, toward heaven as Jesus went up, the Greek word that's used there, uh, it, it denotes them uh, looking until their eyes are straining as they're trying to, uh, to keep an eye on him when, uh, as he's ascending. I don't know if as a, a child you ever had a kite that the string broke or something and you watched it as far as it could go until it was gone. My kite, you know, or a balloon, you watch it that goes off and, you, and not because the balloon is of any great value, but you want to see how long can I watch it before that nanosecond that you see it and the next uh, nanosecond it is, uh, it is gone. And so uh, here it is, they're watching Jesus uh, ascend and, uh, and they're doing it as long as they can before uh, that boundary of their vision, they leave off of him. You think, you, you put yourself in their shoes. Now, uh, one day we're going to see Jesus face to face and we're going to have, uh, get to get a, a bit of a taste of what the disciples had for three and a half years. It was a, a remarkable um, blessing that, that, they, uh, that they enjoyed. And so they're looking up and it's not, nobody's thinking to themselves, okay, um, who, uh, who saw him last? Whose eyesight gave out last? I mean, their hearts, he's leaving. He's going back into heaven. And, and he's given promises and he's given them a great commission and all, but now he is gone. And, and they know that he has, he has told them that he's going to send them another helper in the person of the Holy Spirit, but they are not conversant in that kind of relationship with God. And so there's a lot going on in their hearts as they're watching Jesus ascend uh, in, into uh, heaven. I'm sure there were a lot of emotions there at that kind of end of an era. And of course, what they needed uh, most of all at that, that moment in time, we all do at those times, is we need a, a word from heaven. We need a message from heaven. And that's what they got there in verses 10 and 11. Uh, they're looking up, and somewhere in the course of this, uh, two angels, angelic beings, join them in what they're doing there and, and looking up. And uh, in white apparel, they didn't notice that they, uh, they're appearing at all as they're looking at Jesus and those emotions are going through and thoughts and all. And the word that God sent to them through the angels was twofold. First, men of the Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? And so uh, one uh, exhortation is in the form of a question. 
And, uh, and then the second was in the form of an encouragement. The same Jesus who was taken up uh, from you in heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so the first thing was, okay, gentlemen, the last thing you remember Jesus speaking to you about was he gave you a great commission to make disciples of all nations and uh, the promise of the power to be able to live for him uh, in whatever environment we find ourselves in the world through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we can't be standing out here all the time. It's, it's time to get back uh, to Jerusalem where Jesus said that you're to wait now for that baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then that encouragement to them that uh, just Jesus in the same way that he was uh, taken up into heaven, he'll come in the same manner. And that speaks to the fact that uh, of Jesus' second coming. We know from the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, uh, Zechariah prophesies of Jesus' second coming. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, uh, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, and then uh, the description of Jesus' second coming. It's interesting to be in Israel and to be on the Mount of Olives to realize a lot of things happened on the Mount of Olives. Uh, in terms of biblical history, but to realize this is the place that he ascended and that this is, this is the place in all of the world. I mean, we like to think it's going to be Houston, but it's not going to be. In all of the world, that there on the Mount of Olives, it is waiting for the day that his foot is going to touch on that Mount of Olives again at his second coming, split it, and then make his entry into Jerusalem and to realize all of that is going to happen uh, right here. And so uh, the, the return that they're this return that they're speaking of is that second coming. In the meantime, uh, they've got a lot of work to do, and the work that we've got to do as disciples has continued now for 2,000 years, and it's, and it, it, it's, um, uh, uh, it, it's a, our portion as well. Nothing wrong with uh, prophecy, nothing wrong with uh, looking for the Lord's return. Of course, uh, the bride, the spirit of the bride is to be looking for the return of the Lord, to be aware of the times and the seasons and the signs and these kind of things, but it should never become something where uh, that then uh, we cease to be engaged in this call upon our lives. We find ourselves uh, only waiting and not working while we're waiting. And that's kind of the nudge that they, they get here from these angels with their uh, message. And so, uh, as they have been now exhorted and encouraged by uh, these angelic beings, they then return to Jerusalem Remember, Jesus told them, don't leave Jerusalem until you've experienced the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mount of Olives is right outside of Jerusalem, and uh, uh, just a Sabbath day uh, journey near Jerusalem, as we're told in verse 12, they returned to the city, and when they had entered, they went into an upper room where they were staying. Uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, uh, Philip uh, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, uh, and Simon the zealot, and Judas uh, the son of James, not Judas Iscariot. And, with, and uh, these, all the apostles are up in that upper room now, and they're going to wait, and, and uh, they don't know. Uh, there is a 10-day period between Jesus' ascension into heaven and the baptism with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. All they know is Jesus said, go there and wait for this to happen. They don't know whether it's going to be a half day or two days or what. And so there's that kind of expectancy. And, uh, and so they go there to wait. And uh, what they did while they were waiting for this is everybody continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. They're lifting up praise and adoration and seeking God through prayer. And not only were the 12, or were the 11 uh, apostles there 
but also uh, women who were also disciples of Jesus, and then uh, also Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, uh, and, uh, and Jesus' uh, half-brothers as well, uh, her uh, along with Jesus' brothers. And so they congregate up in that, in that room, uh, waiting for the promise uh, of, of the Father, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and uh, those in attendance are given to us. It's interesting that this is the first and the last mention of Mary um, in the book of Acts. Uh, she, will, she will never be mentioned again in, in the remainder of this history of, of the early church. And, and to also recognize that as she sits in that upper room, she is waiting for the baptism with the Holy Spirit just like everybody else. She is praying to God the Father uh, and seeking Him with prayer and supplication, just like everyone else. I have the highest esteem for Mary and God's choice of her to bring my Savior, the world's Savior, into the world through her. Won't it be something to see her one, one day? But you notice in this environment that she has no kind of elevated status within it. Uh, beyond that, certainly nobody prays to her. Uh, everybody is praying to the Father. She very well uh, much understands who she is. She is in need of all of the blessings of God, all of the promises of Jesus, as much as any disciple like you and me uh, in the world. And so there's this beautiful humility, this beautiful, there's, there's not intended to be this great gulf that exists between us and Mary and our understanding uh, of, of Mary. And so it's a great mistake to to elevate her to places uh, as Roman Catholicism does that uh, are, are never intended and, uh, and only do harm uh, in, in doing so, certainly in making her a co-redemptress or someone that I actually pray to instead of the only mediator that we have between us and God, and that is Jesus. It, at best, it is all very much misguided, and um, we don't see her participating in any of the things that, uh, that she is presented as being or offering to mankind uh, here on this scene. We just see a beautiful, beautiful saint and, uh, and, and unique in human history and God's calling uh, upon her life. And there really isn't a need to make it uh, anything more uh, than that. And so uh, here they are, they're praying, united in prayer and supplication. There's 120 of them up in that room. And uh, each day they give themselves to prayer and then waiting in that upper room for, is this the day? we're going to receive the baptism with, uh, with the Holy Spirit. And so, so far, so good. Now, uh, Peter, remember, he's not baptized with the Holy Spirit yet. That's still a, a little ways out. Peter doesn't appear to be a very good waiter. Um, and uh, some of us can really relate to that. So it, it appears, I don't want to read too much into it, but... He, he, he doesn't appear to be patient in this environment. And so we're waiting. Jesus told us to wait. And here we are. We're praying and, and, and doing this. Uh, but um, it seems to me we could knock out a couple of other things while we're waiting on this. Like to replace Judas as the apostle. I mean, nothing big. Not, not like ordering out pizzas. Well, we're going to... We'll fill in the blanks for God on who's going to be that 12th apostle to replace uh, Judas. And so uh, Peter is nonstop entertainment uh, in, in that way. And so he's looking to make his time doubly, uh, doubly uh, uh, productive. And so uh, we're told there in verse 15 that in those days, while they were waiting, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. So you see him in this upper room, stands up in the middle of, of this group of 120, and he said, men and brethren, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke 
before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. You might remember that when Jesus, be, I mean, Judas betrayed Jesus that uh, for the 30 pieces of silver that he, uh, he, he ended up regretting it. He came and tried to give the money back to the priests. He threw it down on the floor of the area of the temple grounds. Uh, they didn't want to touch that money because it was blood money. And so they used it to purchase a plot of land where um, unnamed people could be uh, buried, poor people could be buried. And, uh, and uh, so he purchased, this man in that way purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. And then concerning his death, falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails uh, gushed out. This gives us a little bit more information concerning the death of Judas. We know from the Gospels that uh, following his betrayal, the uh, attempt to give the money back, uh, that he went out and he hung himself. And so uh, somehow, whether he picked a, a wrong branch or I don't know what the circumstances were, we have no revelation on it, but somehow he falls from that position dead and, uh, and his body hits the ground and, and uh, it, it, everything gushes out. And it became known uh, to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So the, the, that field is called in their own language, uh, Akeldama, which is field of blood. And then Peter then quotes the passages that he is uh, endeavoring to fulfill on behalf of God uh, uh, concerning uh, the replacement of this apostate uh, apostle uh, from, from David, for it is written in the book of Psalms, and here he quotes Psalm 69, Messianic Psalm, let his dwelling place be uh, desolate and no one live in it. Then he also quotes from Psalm 109, verse 8, and let another uh, take his office. And therefore, here's this proposal of these men who have accompanied us all this time that the Lord went in and went out among us, uh, beginning from the baptism of John to that day, here's the requirement. Uh, the replacement has to have uh, uh, been a part of Jesus' water baptism prior to the, 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 the beginning of his public ministry and, uh, and uh, have experienced that and uh, 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 been with him from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up uh, from us, the ascension, one of these must become a witness with us uh, of his resurrection. So they had to be a part of that water baptism by John of Jesus, a witness to it, and then a witness to Jesus' resurrection. Those are the two criteria that uh, the apostle Peter lays out. And so they proposed two, apparently in that group of 120, there were two men that met that criteria. So they proposed both of them, jo uh, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and uh, Matthias. And so they prayed and they said, to you, uh, you, O Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us which of these two you have chosen. You ever uh, prayed to God and offered him a choice of two options and he's not interested in either of them? Uh, it, it's something that I think we all have a little bit of experience with. And so, listen, you got to be busy. <laughs> so we've narrowed this down to two guys for you. All we ask of you is you just show us which of these two is the new apostle. Thank you very much. And that, in this regard, Peter's as, as uh, helpful to God as I am when I endeavor to do his, his job for him. And who you've chosen to take a part in this ministry, an apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, and that he might go to his own place. And they proceeded then to determine which of the two, uh, by the means of casting their lots, the lot fell on Matthias, and he was then numbered with the 11 apostles, becoming the replacement of, uh, of uh, Judas. And so uh, here is Peter. Uh, he lays out his biblical case for uh, replacing Judas as, as an apostle uh, in verse 20. He quotes the two Psalms from David and uh, his understanding uh, that the vacancy 
uh, among, uh, uh, among the apostles that, that, that Judas's position was to be replaced. He's on rock solid ground in his understanding of the scriptures uh, in that way. But his plan gets a little bit sketchy after that, uh, at least in my opinion. So he lays out this course of action for identifying uh, Judas's uh, replacement. Uh, the criteria, as we've mentioned here, concerning uh, Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, then his uh, being an, a person being an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection. And these are the two men that met that criteria. And, uh, and they cast lots, and, and here Matthias became uh, became uh, acknowledged here uh, in, uh, as uh, the, the replacement apostle. Uh, probably in the casting of lots, it, this was an um, Old Testament means of determining the will of God. Uh, the priests generally would consult the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of that in the Old Testament uh, as a means by which God would reveal His will to them. Another way was casting lots, and probably what happened here is they took a ceramic bowl of some kind, a piece of pottery, put their names each on a piece of pottery, threw it down in there, somebody pulled it out, and Matthias's name was pulled out. And, and then they went with that as uh, as the will of God for him to be numbered among the 11 apostles. Now, uh, this passage is one in which uh, students of the Bible are, are divided over whether Peter, what he did here was of the Lord or whether this was something that wasn't of the Lord at, at, at all. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, but the, I think that this was all of it just a product of Peter's self-will and his uh, impatient, impatience. I'm sympathetic to his uh, flesh because I, I, I can share those same things in, in my life. And so th there's nothing more that I would like than to just look and say, Peter nailed it here again. And, uh, and, uh, and this is a model now for us in the book of Acts, but there are just way too many obstacles uh, to that. And we don't want to look at what Peter does here and say, ah, but look at this passage and that teaches uh, this to us when it's teaching us not to do this very, uh, very thing. And, uh, and, and so not a positive example for our uh, learning. It's, a, it's a written for us here so that we can learn from the mistake uh, that, he, that he makes. Otherwise, the lesson would be, listen, when God tells you to wait, and you get tired of wait, waiting, just take it into your own hands and do what comes to your mind. But make sure you got a couple of verses to back it up. Well, that's not a lesson we want to take into our Christian life. That'd be a very different book of Acts uh, if, if that was the, uh, was the case. Now, I think that Peter's right on two fronts here. He's uh, his confidence in the scriptures that they're going to be fulfilled uh, and then uh, absolutely uh, his confidence in the, the divine authorship of, of, of the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. I think where he stumbled was not allowing God to uh, fulfill this in his time and in his way uh, with the person of his choosing. The first problem with Peter's actions here is that it, it violates a very simple and a very clear command that Jesus gave to them in verse four, that they were to go to Jerusalem, wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the only agenda that he wanted them to have in that upper room, not that agenda and then replacing an apostle. Uh, he didn't say anything uh, about that, and, uh, uh, but just the simplicity of waiting for the baptism with the Spirit. And so the next great event in church history was going to be uh, the promise of the Father given on the day of Pentecost. It was not going to be the replacing of Judas uh, as an apostle. The second thing we notice here is that there's no indication that Peter was divinely instructed to stand up and, and address the disciples uh, about anything. I think it's almost painful to read here with the apostles, 11 apostles in that room, and under the influence uh, of Peter, uh, and here they are, they are ministers of a new covenant, they're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, not yet baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they, and, uh, they uh, are casting lots to determine uh, the will of God, and uh, much less 
us to use the casting of lots to determine something so important. It's also significant, I think, that Matthias is never again mentioned in the book of Acts. Good man, without a doubt a good man. He's in that upper room. That's a, an elite kind of uh, situation to be in. Tradition tells us that he became a, a missionary to Ethiopia ultimately, but as it relates to uh, man's choice of him as the apostle to re replace Judas, it appears that uh, God ignores uh, this uh, choice that it has been made in that upper room. Additionally, it, it seems to me that God himself clearly chose in his own time and in his own way uh, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, uh, to ultimately be the replacement, the twelfth apostle, the, to, the one to replace uh, the uh, uh, Judas Iscariot. And you say, well, how do we know that? Well, the Holy Spirit tells us that. Uh, through Paul himself, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul an apostle, not from men nor through man, uh, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him uh, from the dead. And so the book of Acts is just absolutely filled with the ministry of Paul as an apostle. It includes three, his three missionary journeys. Uh, the entire New Testament, in terms of the epistles, are dominated by the Apostle Paul. He, he used by the Holy Spirit to author 13 of the New Testament letters, 14 if we can uh, 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 include, as I think is right, uh, the, uh, the letter to the Hebrews. And so no, no single apostle more dominant in early history uh, than the Apostle Paul. It's clearly Jesus is uh, the Father's uh, choice then for replacing uh, Judas. Now some people, and uh, legitimately, they conclude that Paul can't be numbered among uh, the twelve because he fails to lay out the criteria that, uh, to meet the criteria that P Peter lays out in verses uh, 21 and 22 that any candidate had to be present at Jesus' uh, water baptism uh, by the Apostle John and also have been a witness to Jesus' uh, uh, resurrection. And so, of course, uh, Paul was a witness to Jesus' resurrection. He uh, ran into him uh, quite convincingly on the road to Damascus when he ends up getting uh, saved. But in terms of these two uh, standards that Peter puts forward here. Where did the standards come from on the basis of whose authority? He doesn't, he doesn't give us any verses uh, for it. No indication that he's acting on behalf of God here uh, with a biblical foundation. In fact, Peter himself uh, failed the requirements. He himself was not present at the time that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist to begin his public ministry. Even Peter failed the test that he put forward for everybody else in, in that room. And then additionally, I think that to, to read such an important decision being determined here by the means of casting lots when uh, Jesus spoke to the disciples that they were going to enter into now a, a new relationship uh, with God and a, a, a new means of moving forward, and that is that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. And it's difficult to get excited about those promises that we see of Jesus concerning the Holy Spirit to the disciples, to the church in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, and, and the anticipation that's in our hearts related to the person of the Holy Spirit, and then you go over here and there's casting lots. There's a world of difference between what Jesus had planned and what ultimately unfolded and what Peter had in mind and, and attempted to accomplish in that upper room. Somebody might say, well, they prayed. Yes, they did pray. 
uh, but not all prayers are created equal. James tells us uh, that uh, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss and that you may spend it on your uh, own pleasures. Your prayers are uh, misdirected. And so it's possible to ask amiss. It's possible to ask for something uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, God will feel very free uh, if it, we are asking amiss not to grant uh, our petition. I am almost as thankful for the prayers of mine that God hasn't answered as the, the things that I asked for amiss but had no idea at the moment as the prayers that he, he did answer. And so uh, the rest of the book of Acts from the day of Pentecost on, we will never ever see the early church resorting to the casting of lots to determine the will of God. And so I think clearly uh, Peter uh, uh, got out ahead of himself. And one of the things that is really important, and, and I spent a little bit of time uh, on this, uh, is when we think about the early church and we think about the book of Acts, we began it by saying there is no book of Acts apart from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And we tend to think that that's the only thing that the book of Acts is supremely a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power at work in people's lives. And certainly it is that. Uh, but what I think is oftentimes overlooked is that there would be no book of Acts apart from the leading of the Holy Spirit as well. And so God doesn't give us this power in our lives to then now take it and to use it for our purposes. That power is given to us in order that we might seek His will, determine His will, and then use that power to obey Him in His will for our lives. There is no book of Acts going forward uh, here apart from realizing that this is a, a manifestation, a, uh, a, a, a picture of not only uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, but the leading of the Holy Spirit and the necessity of it in the Christian uh, life. Then we get into chapter two, and uh, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord. So they've gone up into that upper room, they're waiting, uh, and now uh, a 10 day period between Jesus' ascension uh, and the day of Pentecost. So they've been up in that room waiting now for uh, 10 days and, uh, and, and till the day of Pentecost was fully uh, come. And we're told very significantly that these events occurred on the day of Pentecost. Why on the day of Pentecost? What is God communicating uh, to the world, to the church, by imparting this baptism with the Holy Spirit to the early church, to the church, bringing the church into existence formally on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast uh, of Pentecost. And so why does he wait 50 days from the time of his resurrection, uh, you know, roughly a month and a half, uh, in order to pour his Holy Spirit out on the disciples? And of course, there had to be uh, a reason. And, and the reason is that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was done on that day as a fulfillment of that Jewish uh, that Jewish feast. It was to provide to mankind the spiritual substance of which the day of Pentecost was a type or picture to the Jewish people. And, and the word Pentecost, it's a transliteration of a Greek word that means 50. And uh, it always occurred seven weeks in a day after the feast of Paso uh, Passover. The feast of Passover is a celebration of God's deliverance of the Jewish people from their bondage in Egypt. Uh, Jesus' death, uh, burial, and resurrection occurred associated with and in, in a fulfillment of the uh, feast of Passover. And Jesus coming in his death, burial, and resurrection uh, doing the greater thing 
than merely, as significant as it is, merely delivering the Jewish people from the physical bondage of Egypt and to take them then to Canaan, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection occurred on the, on the time of the Passover in order to provide mankind with a even greater deliverance uh, from sin and the bondage of sin and to be led into freedom and to be led into a, an entirely different uh, quality of life. And so Jesus, he fulfilled the feast of Passover uh, in his death and the feast was a, 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 a typical a, a type or a picture of the substance that Messiah would bring into human history in terms of salvation. The same way the Feast of Pentecost was always celebrated in the same way. Uh, in uh, Leviticus chapter 23, there would be offerings made to the Lord. There would be seven burnt offerings that would be offered to the Lord. There would be grain offerings, drink offerings, uh, a sin offering, and a peace offering. And so, uh, pretty standard stuff in terms of Old Testament offerings given uh, to God, especially on the feast days. But there was one thing that made the feast of, of uh uh, Pentecost unique among all of the, the, the feasts and the offerings made to God. And, and it was on the Feast of Pentecost, and that feast alone, it was the only time when leavened bread was brought to God uh, as an offering. It was never burned on the altar but it was brought to God as, a, as an offering. Leaven is a picture of sin in the Old Testament, and uh, all of it is a, a picture of the fact that uh, at the uh, Feast of Pentecost here this day, God would send His Holy Spirit into the world. He would birth this thing called the body of Christ. He would birth the church, but He would do so knowing full well that this church would be less than perfect. It would be made up of uh, imperfect people until one day we get into heaven, but it would be made up of imperfect uh, followers of a perfect Savior. And so that is one of the pictures of uh, the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost by virtue of these events. The Feast of Pentecost was also uh, known as the Feast of Harvest. And so during this feast, the first fruits of, of the grain uh, uh, that was being grown in the fields, it would be brought to God, it would be offered uh, to God. And here uh, 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 on the day when Luke writes, uh, the day of Pentecost had fully come. In other words, not as it is in the Old Testament where it's just a type and a picture, now the day of Pentecost has fully come in its fullness, in its fulfillment in, in Jesus, and uh, you, uh, the substance of the Old Testament feast is, uh, is accomplished by the Messiah because on that day, not only was the church birthed, uh, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming on those 120 in the upper room. Uh, but before this chapter is over, before the day is over, 120 disciples are going to become 3,120 disciples. And so that, that, uh, that Feast of Pentecost was a picture of the Feast of Harvest. And now not only would, uh, on the day of Pentecost, would Jesus, would God birth the church but he would now begin this great harvest of mankind uh, into uh, the, the church. And so, and all of that will happen in response to Peter's sermon, which we won't get to uh, tonight. But it is important to see and to recognize the fulfillment of these feasts so wonderfully and beautifully uh, in the Lord. And so for 1,500 years, um, the day of Pentecost had come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. You do it, go ahead 1,500 times, and you'll get a, a feel for it. But on this day, it fully comes, and, uh, and, and it comes to stay. It was fulfilled by God and, uh, uh, in, in honor of, of His uh, Son, completely 
uh, fulfilled. And so this beautiful picture of the volume of the book testifies of me. Uh, and, and Jesus said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have everlasting life, but these are they which testify of me. And so he fulfills the entirety of the Old Testament. Notice the supernatural phenomenon that occurred uh, with this uh, day of Pentecost and this baptism with the Holy Spirit coming uh, upon the disciples here in that upper room, the 120. Suddenly there came a sound from uh, heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house uh, where they were uh, sitting. And so there they are sitting and all of a sudden there's this sound um, and it sounds like a rushing uh, mighty uh, wind. It doesn't uh, come, the sound doesn't come from the left or from the right, doesn't come horizontally. The sound comes from heaven down on top of them in, uh, in that, uh, that room as they're sitting there uh, in that, that upper room. And so you put yourself in that place and you're praying, waiting, praying for the baptism with the Holy Spirit, this experience with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden you hear this roar like a great wind that's coming closer and closer to you. And then finally the sound just bursts into the room that, that you're sitting in. And, uh, uh, and so the Lord doesn't, if, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, maybe God, what if God confirmed it with the sound of two crickets in a corner of the room? So, were we baptized with the Holy Spirit? Was that what we were waiting for? Well, he knows what he's dealing with in us. So he, he accomplishes this in a way where they recognize we've never seen, experienced anything like this before. Of course, this is what we've been waiting for, the baptism uh, with, uh, with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and you notice, too, that it came as the sound of a, a, a mighty rushing wind. It was not a mighty rushing wind. If it was a mighty rushing wind, it would have put the tiles off of uh, the roofs of every single house in Jerusalem, given the sound uh, of all of this. It was just simply uh, the sound. And not only were they hearing it, but we'll see in a moment that all of Jerusalem was hearing it uh, as, as well. And so it seems that at the sound of the wind, uh, the, the, and, and it's uh, being centered upon that upper room, that people throughout Jerusalem hear it, they begin to make their way as anybody would to the source uh, of that noise, of that sound, and, uh, and to find out what in the world is going on. And it, 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 uh, it does the additional blessing of, of gathering a crowd. And of course, uh, wind is one of the many, uh, several images used of the Holy, in the Bible to speak to of the Holy Spirit. And so they would have recognized that, they would have known that, and just this beautiful announcement in a way that they could understand, uh, hear it is and uh, you didn't miss it and so uh, this uh, fulfillment Jesus made the promise and he fulfilled it uh, here and I think with the, the greatness of the sound they got a sense of the kind of power that the Holy Spirit uh, offers to us I doubt they ever forgot that sound uh, the rest of uh, their lives the other thing that we notice that occurs here is then in verse 3, uh, at, at, at the same time, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And so Luke has, if you have trouble um, picturing this in your mind, and I've seen paintings and drawings and sketches of this kind of thing, everybody can have their own idea. But if you look at that and you say, what in the world did that look like? Well, Luke's having some trouble explaining it, uh, even himself, and, and w with the eyewitnesses to all of it that he had uh, talked with, he uses that, uses that language as of. In other words, it wasn't an actual fire, but fire was the closest thing that he knew to try and explain it. And so he, he has a, a, a supernatural something happening. He has a limited vocabulary in trying to describe it, and, uh, and he does his best. A.T. Robertson, who is the author of a very excellent resource called Word Pictures in the New Testament, 
and it examines the meaning of the Greek and the original language of, of the New Testament. He writes concerning this, that what is being described here is uh, that a fire-like appearance presented itself at first in the room as a single body, and then suddenly sections of flame then began to break away as if to cut uh, uh, off from the larger whole and then to rest upon each person uh, present. And so you see this beautiful picture of the awesomeness of the, the Holy Spirit, how personal He is, and even uh, as, he, as He would come in, in His understanding of it, come in in this, this single way and then unite the entire group by, his Holy, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, as as well. Fire, of course, is another uh, common symbol of the Holy Spirit uh, in in scriptures, uh, and and so that becomes a part of this uh, day of Pentecost scene as well. And then in verse four, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them uh, utterance. And so they're immediately filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak. Uh, with other tongues as, the, as they're given utterance. They begin to speak languages uh, that, uh, that they had not previously uh, learned or had any knowledge of it, at all. And, uh, and I, I'm sure certainly communicating in part that this birth of the church was going to encompass not just Jerusalem, but it was going to encompass ultimately the entire uh, the entire uh, earth, that uh, it would be made up, the church, not only of Jews, but of every tribe, every tongue, every language, every people, and every uh, nation. I think the reason for some of these, the miraculous events surrounding the day of Pentecost, first to make it unmistakably clear to the disciples, yes, you have received the baptism uh, with the, the promise here that you've been waiting for. Uh, second, for the sake of those in Jerusalem, and remember, this is a feast day. They say concerning uh, the Feast of Pentecost that of the three f Jewish feasts in the, in the Jewish religious calendar, that this was the one that was, had the heaviest attendance. And one of the reasons being that because of the time of the year uh, that it, it occurred, uh, in, in that almost two months after the Passover, the shipping lanes of the world opened up, the weather improved vastly, and so people were then able, uh, more easy to make that pilgrimage to Jerusalem as the Jewish men were required to do. To do. So the city, would, uh, the city would go from a population, base population of about 150,000 uh, to historians tell us somewhere in the vicinity of a million people then there. And they're coming to seek God. So Jesus, so God the Father does this with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and He's got a very motivated audience. It's, it's who He wants to reach. He wants to reach the whole world, but it's who He wants to reach here is they're coming to, uh, to honor God and acknowledge God in the shadow or the symbolism of the Feast of Pentecost and God says, I see the hunger in your heart. I'm going to give you the reality of what it's always represented. And, uh, and, and so uh, there they were, and, and he does it in this way so that it would raise questions in their minds that they would then ask about the event and open the door then for Peter to uh, preach to them and then uh, launch the church in a big, a big way with a, a sermon where... 3,000 uh, are saved before the day uh, is over. So a very, very special event, and, uh, and it warranted a, a, special, uh, a special day, and it warranted a special uh, event. And so this, uh, this, this beautiful supernatural of that day. And there were dwelling there in verse 5. Uh, in Jerusalem, Jews, they were devout men from every nation under heaven. They'd come all over the, from all over the world, as I said. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. I mean, we'd put ourselves in the, in the shoes. It'd be like a UFO dropping down, and we'd all run uh, there. I mean, it'd be a stupid thing to run toward, but we are curious creatures. And, um, and, and so they, they came together. What in the world is this? They're confused because uh, presumably the 120 have now spilled out of that upper room down onto the street. And so here they are, they, they are speaking and worshiping and praising God in this, 
uh, in, in tongues, in an, in an unknown language uh, to them, and they then encounter uh, the disciples, 120 now, uh, on a street level. Uh, some people even believe that this occurred somewhere in the vicinity of the southern steppes in Jerusalem. And, uh, and that where Jesus had made the promise concerning the baptism with the Holy Spirit uh, about the, the Spirit coming upon us and, uh, and, and fulfilling it right in that sight. We can't, can't be sure, but it wouldn't, be surpri- it wouldn't surprise me. They're confused. They hear everyone speak in uh, his own language. So you have people from all over the world and they're hearing these people praise God in languages that are uh, uh, foreign. They're not Hebrew. They're, uh, they're not even uh, uh, Greek. They're not Aramaic. It's all kinds of languages. I think fully 16 different languages are being uh, spoken by the disciples. They were all amazed, and, uh, and they marveled at this. And they then asked one another as they're out on the street, they said, look, are not all these who speak Galilee? Galileans. They probably recognized them to be Galileans by virtue of their dress. Uh, the Galilee region was kind of Hicksville compared to Jerusalem. And so there was a different kind of dress, a different kind of appearance. And they said, how in the world can these people up there from the Galilee be here in Jerusalem? And, uh, and they are speaking all of these uh, different kinds of, of languages uh, uh, to us here in this Uh, in this place, and how is it we hear uh, in our own language in which we were born? Uh, The language of the Parthians and the Medes being spoken, and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Perga, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Lydia, uh, Libya adjoining, Cyrene, visitors from Rome, uh, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking our, in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. This is important to recognize related to the gift of tongues. And most often in Pentecostal circles, they will refer to the gift of tongues as the gift of tongues, and then we're going to receive a message in tongues. And their understanding of the gift of tongues is that it is the means by which uh, God uh, speaks to us from Himself. So the direction is upward and down. But everywhere you see the, book of, uh, the, the gift of tongues manifest in the book of Acts, it is never in that direction. That's what the gift of prophecy is for, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, supernatural coming from God down to us and through us into the church or into the world around us. Always the gift of tongues, when it is properly interpreted, will be an expression of praise, declaring the wonderful works of God, declaring, uh, lifting up adoration and supplication to God. And uh, then you know you're dealing with a proper interpretation of a gift of tongues. And so they are hearing and they're curious about it. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this uh, mean? And so that's precisely the scene uh, that God wanted to establish, not only to bless the disciples with this experience and, and, uh, and, and that same experience available uh, to us today, whatever, uh, as we would ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receive it, uh, but also to gain the attention Uh, of the lost people, though religious, in Jerusalem, so that the second part of the fulfillment of the day of Pentecost could occur, and that is to bring in the harvest. And it sets the stage now for Peter to stand up, 
correct, answer their question, correct their misunderstanding of the event uh, through the preaching, which is going to have a tremendous result. Some of them, and it's always the case where you have human beings, they can look at the same thing and one group of people by personality, they'll look at it, they'll be curious, they'll want to understand it. And then there's the other group that goes, they're all drunk. And they just dismiss it with, uh, with scorn. And, um, and there, were, uh, there were both uh, kinds of Jews there on this scene. And we'll stop there tonight. And next time we'll pick it up with Peter's sermon. And then the rest of chapter 2. Uh, so important in what the lessons that it has uh, for us. So there we have it. And uh, uh, this, this beautiful, beautiful day in church history, and the implications of which continue in our, our lives today. If you sit here this, this evening and you are not yet uh, a Christian, um, it, 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 God's message to you this evening is that He loves you, your sin has separated you from Him in a relationship with Him, and He has provided His Son to provide you with the forgiveness of sins so that you can have a relationship with Him, the relationship that you've been created for. And if you've never done that, then we'll be up in front after the service and we'd love to pray with you to begin that personal relationship with God that will last forever and ever. If you need prayer for anything tonight, we'd love to pray with you and for you as well. Let's stand together now and we'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you for our heritage. We thank you that you have provided us with this record of the early church that teaches us about our roots, about all of this being the fulfillment of promises that you had given concerning your Messiah all the way back to Genesis. And the firm foundation that is ours in our faith in Christ you recognizing what our needs are in our life, your provision uh, for that, Lord. And we thank you tonight for the baptism with the Holy Spirit, for the power to be able to live a life that is a witness to you, both in the doing and in the saying, in the contemplating and how we see people, how we see the world around us, and to be able to do it in a way that looks like Christ, no matter where we are in the world. We thank you for the change that your salvation has brought into our lives. We thank you for the additional change that your baptism with the Holy Spirit has brought into our lives as well. We've taken hold of this lesson that the book of Acts is not merely um, a, uh, solely a, a witness to uh, the power of your Holy Spirit, but also to his wisdom and the importance of not only the power, but of His leading. And you see us, you see us so clearly, each one of us. You know as we're growing in our walk with You, we're trying to learn all of these things, and we pray that You would help us to keep growing in both those dynamics of the Christian life, the receiving of Your power, the operating out of Your power, but then, Lord, also um, uh, recognizing Uh, your wisdom here as well and the importance of the leading of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray you bring these two uh, great things together in a powerful way, that you unite them in a powerful way, that our lives might be um, uh, supernaturally um, effective and fruitful for you. And we ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.